Welcome to the um, Survivor Series testing. We've got myself, Lee, Head Brewer Production Director, Wayne, Andy, and Jason has joined us from Yakima Chief Hops um, because these, this series of four beers has been produced in conjunction with Yakima Chief to promote their recently launched Cryo Pop. As to what that is, we'll be handing over to Jason shortly and he'll give you some specifics as to uh, what the compound is and what it does in the beer. Um, so we've got four different beers. Um, we've kind of approached it in a scientific manner. Um, so we've taken one, which is the control, and it is only made with the cryo hop substance. That's the first beer that we have, which is Big Popper Pump. Um, we then went in three different directions with three other hops. So we went and took a traditional hop, quite an old classic one, Chinook, um, and we did sweet Chinook music. Uh, tried to show how Chinook can be kind of presented in a slightly different way. Uh, went in conjunction with the cryo pop, um, and then we went um, for this one's an Idaho Seven, <laughs> so like kind of a, a modern favourite. Um, yep. So that is in Scotty, Scotty too hoppy. hoppy. Yeah. Should remember these by now. <laughs> uh, and then the final one, which I think is actually my favourite of the four, is called the Thunder Turker. Um, and that's been done with the like latest breed of hops, which is a, a slightly different strain called the Neo Mexicanus uh, strain of hops. Uh, and so far, you've released two different types, Sabro and Talus. Yes. And, and we've made this one with Talus. And for me, that's the favourite of the four. But you can all make your own judgments. So you guys so. have all got your drinks in front of you, and you're able to taste them. We've got cans in front of us, but we haven't got glasses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can we have a glass, please? please. Thank you. Nice. So do you want to tell us a little bit more about the cryopop substance, how it came about, what it's intended to do? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, it's a new, new product for us, um, launched last month. Um, but it's been years in, in development at our R&D uh, lab in Yakima. Um, and it's a, it's a supercharged blend of beer soluble compounds. That's the kind of key thing to think about. So these are uh, the hot compounds that survive the rigorous brewing process, survive the heat, survive the fermentation, and actually have the highest impact uh, in the finished beer. Um, so the, the concept was we wanted to capture the brewers always come to us and, and ask how do we how do we you know grab that that those aromas and flavours that we find um, on the rub on the hot rub, how do we translate that into the into the finished beer, into the glass. Um, so we have uh, technology in our labs, some of the only technology in, in the world that can detect these, these particular compounds. Um, so we, we, we found that in the finished beer there was a particular group of compounds that would always, always, always be there. So we worked back from that and we thought how can we you know, get those into a concentrated concentrated pellet all in one encompassing pellet. So that's, that's, uh, that's how Cryopop came to be. Um, so a little bit of background on uh, Yakima Chief, so uh, brew, ourselves, Brew York, um, we started using um, hops from day one, but we weren't able to get a very good um, hop contracts. Hops are, you contract in advance for them because they're, 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 they're harvested and grown in um, different varieties, different um, different hops and, and they're, they're in demand, but there's lots of breweries out there who want these hops, so um, you've got to try and contract them in advance, Tell, choose which varieties you want to work with and, um, and reserve them and, uh, and basically pre-order them effectively. So um, when we got the chance to work with um, Yakima Chief, we, 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 we jumped pretty much straight into it. Um, the, uh, the, the contracts we were getting at the time before we started working with Yakima Chief weren't very good and we were having to make the most of what hops we could get, whereas now we can actually look at what varieties we want to work with, what, what hop um, specific, specific hops we find work really well in beers and the flavours that we like and then we um, we'll work with the, the, the guys at Yakima Chief and um, forward order these contracts. So when the um, chance came to actually do a development, uh, de work on a developmental hop like this and do something really cool, we thought it'd be a great idea to try and showcase what this hop variety brings to the different beers. Um, and yeah, I guess the, the other thing we're pro probably worth noting is um, Yakima is in America, so it's, uh, <laughs> we're assuming everyone knows that, but, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a region in America um, do you want to tell us yeah, a bit more sure. About? Yeah, so we're um, a 100% grower-owned hop company. 
um, based in Yakima, Washington State. Um, and yeah, this is it's awesome to hear because uh, you know our, our mission is to to connect those family hop farms with the world's finest brewers. So uh, it's these kind of projects that we're we're always so excited to work on. And um, yeah, it's it's been great fun coming up with these uh, these beers and, and, and names and uh, to showcase the new the new uh, products, the new hop uh, blend, and uh, even better to try the finished product yeah. finally. Um, we we, so, um, we we met um, one of your colleagues, um, Nick Siegler, who's um, formerly of Magic Rock. Uh, he used to live in York, so we, we got a good working relationship with uh, with Nick when he was based in York, um, and he's helped on this project as well. And one of the things you you, you, you worked on is the, the actual malt base to start with to try and get the same malts in every beer, and then you just change in the hops in each one. And part of that malt base was a, uh, we used a, quite a dark malt, didn't we, to try and get a bit of colour into the beer, as opposed to your, yeah. your more modern, hazy, super pale beers. We wanted it to look more of a traditional, um, old school American pale ale, dark, darker colour. Um, so yeah, it's quite a, <laughs> it is quite a dark coloured um, beer. When you and then the malting it. company that we ordinarily use is um, a company called Crisp. Um, and then they do small projects where they release unique um, malted barleys to market. Uh, and they released a toasted oat thing, which is kind of new. So there's a bit of a kind of a popcorn-like character going on in here as well, which is coming from those, those toasted oats. So I found um, this, this is the uh, base base. This is just using cryo pop hops. When I tasted it, when it first came out of tank, um, I found quite a lot of um, coconut type flavor profile coming through. So it's quite quite a unique hop and um, it's enjoyable. It's, it's refreshing, but you're getting lots of different. Yeah. It's not like a citrusy um, type of notes that you, you sometimes get with, with hops like Citra. You get quite a like a so coconut background. It's a proprietary blend um, of hops that have high levels of these hop soluble compounds. Yeah. So beer soluble. Yes, and I, I imagine you don't even know what that blend is, and even if you did know, you would not be allowed to tell us. <laughs> um, but I think. I would hazard a bet that there's a decent amount of neo Mexicanas type in here because you do get that pineapple and coconutty character and that's what Sabra and Talis in particular are known for. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, this, this new idea of, of beer soluble compounds um, has allowed us to kind of uh, measure that in each of the varieties so we can actually, it allows uh, the you know, breweries as well to, to, to use that information and have more control over what hop combinations uh, to put together. Um, actually having that knowledge of, of you know, levels of uh, you know, geraniol, linalol, um, the esters, um, the monotypic uh, alcohols, um, yeah, functional profiles. Um, it allows you to uh, have better control over how to capture that the aromas you want in the finished beer. And, uh, and you won't necessarily know the names of those hop compounds, but you will know the flavours. Yes. So geraniol is like geranium, so that's where the floral kind of flavour that you would get in a hop would, uh, in a beer would come from. Uh, Linalil is the lemony one. Yeah, it's yeah. Like a, a citrusy type Super character fruity, coming yeah. through. So, yeah. so, so as you can imagine, when we were working on the this concept, and we were speaking to Jason and the team at Yakima Chief, um, Lee was completely geeking out and uh, talking all the uh, oh, science. <laughs> Oh, uh, and we got that on camera. Yeah. We have that brilliant. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. That's the pop. Yeah, yeah. that's the, yeah, the pop in the cryo pop. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. so we're filming two of these, are we? So you're not going to edit that out, though, are you? No. Right. Brilliant. <laughs> so one of the um, interesting Sorry, things. Is, yeah. <laughs> it, 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 save some of the base beer if you've still got any left in your can, um, because when we try the other beers um, shortly, you'll be able to like, compare and contrast. It seems a bit difficult for me now. <laughs> you can drink some off the floor. Um, no, I'm, I'm fine. You've got loads more, though, so I'll top up. Right, yeah, here we go. I think he was struggling that much, he was pouring his beer out. <laughs> um, okay. At this stage, you guys have any questions about this specific beer? We'll talk more about obviously the concept and the other beers as well. But if there's anything you want to you want to find out more about? Then... Uh, definitely getting the sabro in there. Like, I was wondering, like, the, is it still pellets that you're making? Like, yeah, yeah. So, um... so, so uh, because you won't be picked up on the microphone, you need to repeat the question before you give the answer. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, was the question? Is, was it pellets that we used? Is it used still in, in pellet form? In pellet form. Yes. Was this in? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so this is actually a cryo pellet. So I just 
just need to dry hop in Brewers Bees and Type 90 pellets. Uh, cryo hops, cryo hop pellets so were a, a new line of products that we launched in 2017. Um, and that again is a, is a concentrated lupulin pellet. Um, so the process is we've, we've kind of taken the raw hop uh, and separate, separate it into two, two materials. The, the, the kind of vegetal material, the plant material, the, the brack, the string, the plant, and then the, the concentrated lupulin. Um, so yeah, you can kind of double concentrate uh, on all the lovely essential oils and hot compounds and all the lovely fruity stuff that we, we like to try in the, uh, in the finished beer. Um, yeah, but I, I think we've used there's both Type 90 and Clare into this. Yeah, so, so Type 90 is your typical pellet where you would take the hop and you would crush it um, in a die, yeah. um, and I believe the die size is different for different varieties um, of hop, depending on yeah. how that's going to perform in the beer. Um, and then the cryo one, I, I love the signs behind the cryo ones, it's because you fire liquid nitrogen at it, don't you? Yeah, so and then the, the brack, the vegetable matter, then falls away and you're left with the concentrated glucose. Yeah, that's the main cryo came from, it's, it's all done under kind of minus 35 degree uh, temperatures and oxygen free, so it's all about kind of uh, maintaining the, the, the integrity of the, the, the lupulin glands and capturing that, that, that beautiful aroma. Um, so um, just just very very brief overview of beer itself. So it's a, there's four core ingredients that go into beer. Water is the main one, ninety percent of the beer. Um, you've then got your malt, which we get the sugar from that, that makes alcohol later on. You have the hops, which a lot of the flavour and uh, t taste comes from, and then you have your yeast, and the yeast makes the alcohol. So there's four compounds, um, and hops in particular. Um, uh, something that breweries like ourselves and, and most of the breweries actually at this festival um, focus a lot on because they, they, they can do so much to your beer and um, we used to use um, they, 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 they grow, they grow on vines like um, like uh, grapes and basically um, the, the hops themselves are like a, a cone um, got some imagery on the, on the cans but where we try to yeah we haven't got our uh, hop shirts on <laughs> Um, and that's how traditionally you used to use hops. You used to basically use whole leaf um, and, and, and you used to either boil them or so, so they used to even put them in pellets in the, a, a big chunky pellet in the cask in the to cask, dry yeah. it up in them. Whereas no, nowadays what, what we tend to use is we, we'll, we'll put hops in the kettle, boil the liquid, get the flavour and bitterness um, and then we'll do something called dry hopping where we add the hops right in the, in the fermenter later on in the process and that gives you a lot more flavour and aroma. Um, and we used to use um, whole leaf for pretty much all our brewing and then um, in, 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 the, in the kettle and then we'd use pellets in the um, fermenter. We've now switched to pellet only which is, makes the brewer's life a lot easier. Um, there's a lot of, if you think about it, every time you, you put a, um, a hop uh, into, into a liquid it soaks up the liquid. So um, at the end of the, the boil, you boiled a, a kettle and you, you boiled the sugary liquid. You've then got to get those hops back out of the kettle. So that involves climbing inside of it and, and scooping it all out, which is a boiling hot, well, a, a slightly cooling vessel. It's like going into a sauna and then doing a workout. It's horrible. Thankfully, we don't do it any much anymore. So. <laughs> Maybe we <laughs> the, should. Uh, the beer bellies, but yeah, um, it's, it's quite a manual process and um, quite physical. Um, now that we use pellets, basically at the end of the process, you, um, you rinse the kettle. You, you basically um, put liquid in, you, you, you clean it that way. You don't need to physically go in. So it's a, it's a lot easier and you get a lot more intense flavour from the pellet. So um, we switched to, to, to pellets uh, a few years back and uh, it's definitely uh, made our, our lives and the brewers' lives a lot easier. That's another huge benefit of the cryo hops as well. Um, when you talk about uh, adding that rate, the high dry hopping rates these days, that's a lot of hop going into the beer and then, yeah. like I say, mm -hmm. soaking up the, the liquid. Whereas with cryo hops, because it's kind of so concentrated, you can add up to 50% you know, less. Uh, as a kind of general guideline. You should probably tell him that. He just uses them the same concentration yeah. and it uh, costs a fortune. And you'll still get the same the same intensity, the same flames, a lot very clean uh, hop character, um, but you're also in improving your yields as well. Um, yeah, several several benefits as well as the uh, so, flavours and aromas as well. So we're going to move on to the next beer now. Um, if you've still got some of your beer left, that's great because you can, you can compare and contrast. But the next one along is Sweet Chinook Music. So we should probably at this point also talk about the concept for the beers. So when we decided we wanted to do this um, this range and we worked with um, Yakima Chief on it, the um, the whole cryo pop hop is about 
uh, maximising the survival compounds and enhancing the flavour. So um, we love our puns. So we, we, uh, it was the YCH guys, didn't it, who came up with the, the name? Oh, well, the whole concept of the, the cryo pop is about survivable compounds. Yes. So I think from that we jumped onto Survivor Series. Survivor Series. Survivor Series, of course, being an <laughs> iconic annual wrestling event. Thank you. Um, and then from that point, we had so much fun just throwing <laughs> names at each other in terms of which wrestlers we could use, which kind of twist on the names we could do. Uh, we probably could have done about 12 beers with the ideas that we came up with. Yes, we've got about three or four years worth of uh, <laughs> beer names. So the uh, the first one we had was Big Papa Pump. It's a Big Papa Pump uh, based on Scott Steiner, wrestler, and fought with the cryo pop. It, it worked quite well. Second beer, Sweet Chin Up Music, was um, if anyone is a wrestling fan like we are, um, Shawn Michaels' finishing move was called Sweet Chin Music. So it was just a play on that. And Chinook happens to be one of my favourite hops. It's such such a, um, an old school, I say old school, it's not that old, but um, in terms of the brewing life cycle, um, Chinook isn't as popular now as it used to be, but it's a, it's a really, really um, interesting hop. And um, we were talking yesterday at the bar, and I was, just, I was saying to Jason, it'd be really cool if we'd have, we could have done so many different beers here, but if we'd have had a um, cryo pop, only beer, a Chinook only beer, and a Cryo Pop and Chinook blend, and you could have seen how they enhance the flavours. But um, we, we took, took a slightly different approach to try to show how they enhance the different hops and the different um, varieties. But hopefully, you guys will appreciate this one. It's an uh, interesting beer. For, for me, of the four beers, this is the one that demonstrates the most what Cryo Pop can do. Yeah. Because uh, Chinook yeah, ordinarily is kind of herbal, a little bit spicy, a little bit piney. Um, uh, whereas this you can't, yeah, isn't, there's no pineiness. Yeah, it's in this actually part. quite fruity, and it's, uh, it's transformed the presentation of the Chinook. Yeah, absolutely, um, and that's, that's one of the uh, major uses for cryo pop. Is you know it, it can enhance any other variety really. It will, you know, you can, you can combine that with the high concentrations of, of those compounds. It's going to help lift other varieties up. Um, that's one of the I think big uses. Um, big ways it can use it is as this kind of blend amplifier or, or, or hot combination amplifier um, and that's, that's captured that really well there. Yeah I mean um, we, we've done quite a lot of um, piney west coast um, style, Amer west coast of America style beers recently where you, you, you're going back to your old uh, old school Sierra Nevada style beers where you've got the, this, this nice classic character and that's the type of hop we would normally use in that so you know um, this, this is completely different profile completely isn't it it's, um, it brings out uh, more fruit if, if I had to blind test, uh, test this beer I would not say it was yeah. made with Chinook yeah. um, which, uh, which yeah. is what that was the idea wasn't it to use Chinook we thought let's use a classic and, yeah. and uh, let's see what, what, what we can yeah I think we've do. picked from every kind of aspect of the, yeah. the kind of hop spectra um, yeah the, this really for me is the one that yeah. has it's changed the most yeah. Yeah. definitely well, um, a, a yeast that was conceived by one of the main sponsors of this beer festival, uh, Verdant um, IPA yeast, uh, which is produced by a company called Lalamand. So we work relatively close with Lalamand. One of their um, account managers, Rob, um, uh, he, he keeps us in the loop when there's up and coming products and we can try out. We, we do, hopefully, you're, you're familiar, we do quite a wide spectrum of beers. We, we, we do. Um, intense um, stouts to hoppy um, pails to um, sour and fruity beers and all, all sorts and um, because they're, they're experimenting all the time with their yeast strains but also um, they're, they're coming up with these sour pitches where you can actually use it to, to create um, sh shortcut sour beers <laughs> we were talking about this yesterday in our live session where we, we we were talking about how um, some breweries make uh, what we deem real sours, where they actually introduce wild bacteria into the, the, the process, uh, wild yeast, and they, they, they make um, more, more traditional spontaneous sours. We make um, cheat sours in that we can um, introduce the sour pitch, we can, we can sour the beer and then we can sterilise it and use our fermenters still, and use our cannon line still. If we made real sour beers the traditional way, you wouldn't be able to brew pale beers on the same kit because you'd basically spoil the beer. Uh, we're, so, yeah. we're, we're lucky, we live in a golden age of craft beer. Uh, if you went back as far as 10 years ago, in terms of what we could access, in terms of hops and yeast, there was nothing like the playing field that we have now. So over the last few years, Lalamand has done a great job of releasing all these new yeast to market and 
Yakima's done a great job of changing the way in which we can use our hops and present them in our beers. You might have to edit our, um, our, our, our sidetrack into uh, yeasts and uh, sour beers out of the uh, final <laughs> video on, um, on hoppy beers. But the but yeast itself it, plays a big part in how the hops huge, present yeah. themselves and yeast can be neutral in that they create alcohol, they don't contribute flavour. With one like Verdant, um, it's also contributing flavour. It creates some fruity esters in there which play nicely alongside all of these different hop compounds. And it's very expensive. <laughs> it is. Very um, so yeah, you take your typical. We, we use we use an American style yeast normally, um, and it's um, it's almost twice the price, isn't it? Well, it's more than twice the price yeah, it's because a, um, different yeasts need to be pitched at different mm -hmm. rates to do the job of creating the alcohol, uh, and that particular one costs twice as much, and you have to use twice as much of it. So technically winning that all, makes it four times as Winning much. all round for the uh, yeah. for the East Spire. So speaking of music, hopefully you guys enjoyed that. Um, they're all 5.5% these beers, so it's, it's the same base malt, we, we mentioned that. So that's where you get the sugar from to create alcohol. So if you put the same sugar in each each beer um, from the malt and you ferment them the same way, it should all end up the same strength. The hops are, are bringing different different attributes to the beer, but the, uh, they're not affecting the, the alcohol. Oh. One goes to the geek. They sometimes do, but yeah, they, they shouldn't shouldn't affect the alcohol too, too much. Yeah, let, let's not get into the technicalities <laughs> of hop creep. Idaho Seven, so Scotty Two Hoppy. Um, do you guys want to talk about Idaho Seven? No, let's talk about Scotty Two Hoppy. <laughs> um, so I think Jason and I are, are particular wrestling geeks. Yeah. So as I said earlier, we had great fun throwing around names. I'm, I'm, I'm throwing it down myself now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, we had lots of fun throwing around the names. And as soon as we came up with, with this one, it was a no-brainer. Scotty Too Hotty, Scotty Too Hoppy. Back in the day, he was one of my favourite wrestlers doing yeah. the worm across the uh, ring. Show it, show it. No, <laughs> I'm not capable. Even in my peak form, I would never have been able to do that. Yeah, that was one that was, um, some of the names took a while to come together, but that one was just there from the start, yeah. wasn't it? It just had to be. Just that and Big Popper Pump, Cryo Pop, so it had to be Big Popper yeah. Pump, so. I want, yeah. yeah, I think I was hoping for the, can you smell what the pop is cooking? <laughs> it's on back to one of the yeah. Maybe a bit long from the name, but yeah, Big Popper well. Pump. It's never stopped us before. We've gone with stupidly long names before. So uh, well, people that are even more craft than we are um, have lots of long beer names. <laughs> Yeah. No, I don't. Seven, That's yeah. Really, really um, easy drinking, actually. Um, the other two, that, that one just tastes a bit, um, I don't know, easy to drink. <laughs> That's the only way I can describe it. it just... Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't. Seven's a very new hop, um, released in 2015, by uh, developed by Nate Jackson from Jackson Farms in uh, Wilder in Idaho. Um, and this in itself, on its a variety of its own, has a fantastic blend of these compounds. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderfully complex, kind of layered flavour. It, it develops on the palate, you know, you're going to get lovely pineapple, citrus, tropical, a bit of black tea, pine. Um, so, yeah, Idaho. You said black tea? Bit of, bit of subtle black tea. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's what I missed it, today. I think just tea, tea without milk. <laughs> <laughs> We, we cheated. The question was, uh, did we do four separate brews? Um, um, but we cheated a little bit. We did three brews, didn't we? Excuse me. No, no, <laughs> no. We did do. No, we did do four separate oh, ones at the end. Um, because the malt bill was the same, the temptation was to do it as one big brew and then split. split. It and then but we need. We wanted to do it in such a quantity that it made more sense to do them individually. Um, and part of the dry hopping was done mid fermentation. So you can add hops at different points, so some in the kettle, some at the end of fermentation. And quite a more modern concept to do is to put them in during fermentation. So if you're ever taught to brew, the textbook would say, don't ever put hops in during fermentation because it interferes with what the yeast is trying to do. But we've all kind of torn up the textbooks now and we all now put hops in uh, during fermentation. Um, it encourages kind of agitation, there's like a convection current going on in there and it increases the kind of absorption rate of the hop compounds. Um, and with certain use, you can also get something called biotransformation. So it will, um, to, to biotransform, 
is an organic thing changing one chemical compound into another chemical compound. So yeast can take uh, perhaps some compounds that are not overly flavorful and it can turn them into compounds that are nice and fruity. So um, this type of yeast does do that. So it has the ability to transform um, some flavours into more interesting yeah. flavours. And that's the other big big use of cryopop as well, is, to, is to, to load the beer with these compounds that have the highest potential for biotransformation to take place. Um, so that was another big factor in, in the development of cryopop was uh, you know, providing brewers uh, with, with that raw material to uh, increase the, that biotransformation activity in the beer. Yeah, it's all about you know increasing that high impact aroma in, in the finished beer. It's, um, it, it's amazing the amount of work that's going on with the hops these days. And these compounds to which we keep referring, it's called thiols, and for, for years they were, they were ignored because they appear in such small quantities that we didn't think they could possibly be having a big impact on what the beer was. But now what we've come to realise is that the flavour th threshold for them is really, really low. So even though they appear in incredibly small quantities, they actually have a massive impact in the overall flavour of the beer. So a lot of the modern hop science is around how you create, how you promote these different compounds, these styles um, in the beers. One of the interesting things about hops, um, because of the way they're, they're grown, it, it's, it's, not, it, it, it's not, not as reactive as you'd, you'd hope. So, so all of a sudden, if, if the, um, this blend or um, Chinook, for example, became really popular, the, brew, the, the um, farmers can't just change their crop over and all of a sudden um, grow a load of Chinook for next year. It takes years to get to 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 to, 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 um, to cultivate and to, to grow. And uh, what's, what's what's the realistic lead time? Is it about three to four years? So? I'm yeah. on that. I mean, in Yakima, the Akama, the conditions are so good. Actually, we can actually get a get a great crop on the, on the first year. Right. Uh, I think in the UK, it's, it's maybe two or three years for a plant to, to mature. But uh, yeah. But the research and development timeline's oh, a lot yeah, longer. To, 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 uh, I mean, it's akin to like pharmacology absolutely. in terms of how long it actually takes to develop something and bring it to market. Yeah, it's, it's more like 10 years for, uh, yeah. from the initial cross to commercial release. Um, it, it's like it's, it's a 10 to 11 year process. So, so you find that um, really interesting popular varieties, the, 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 the price obviously rockets because as demand goes up, um, you can't grow it quick enough, then um, the, the, the price increases on that, those crops. And your variety, so, so she looks actually really affordable, isn't it? It's not, it's not a, an expensive hop variety, but it's an amazing hop variety. That, that About we, 16 we, pounds a kilo, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, whereas previously, I mean, going back two, two years, maybe a little bit more, um, Citra and Mosaic were the really expensive hops, weren't they? Now, now they're actually really affordable and um, a lot of the uh, newer varieties are the ones that are, that are going it's, up. It's all price. about the amount of uh, acres that they're planted on. Mm. So you see trends in, in hops, things come in vogue and fall out of vogue. Um, and citra is so hugely loved now that the farmers have ripped up other older, not so sexy varieties and have planted citra in its place. So consequently, it's so widely available now its price has come down a long way from where it once was. Yeah, and that's, that's all about the communication as well, the, the connecting with the growers, with the, with the brewers. Um, you know, they can have much more of a direct uh, communication on that and make sure that, uh, we want to make sure everyone has access to their favourite hops and, and uh, maintain that, that healthy supply chain for everyone in the supply chain. Um, and and so this is why we have to forward contract, like Wayne was saying earlier, there's forward contract and this is essentially telling the farmers what to plant. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what, one of the things we were at, um, lots of things obviously went on in the last 18 months and uh, Covid uh, impacted most businesses massively. One of the things we were really disappointed with is um, we were about to fly out to America to do the um, hop, to join the hop harvest, to go look at the varieties, see, the, see what, what was being grown and uh, actually get to um, see it for ourselves. So we didn't get a chance to do that. And we, and we're not going to do it again this year, because it's around about September, isn't it? You yeah. ordinarily do that, yeah. Um, so I guess we'll see you in Yakima next September then. But yeah, we'll just we'll keep doing festivals instead and go to <laughs> get, get out to, to amongst the public again. So um, any updates on the favourite so far? Yeah. It's um yes yeah, so, so when pe 
my, uh, my my partner um, is exactly the same. She doesn't like um, bitter beers, so so, so um, she always says, says to me, "I don't like the hop, uh, hoppy beers." I'm like, the hops bring different flavour character, characteristics. So, so the bitterness is a um, is, is something that happens when we put the hops in during the boil, and it releases. Uh, well, go to the go to the science. Here's the sciencey bit. Um, well, the, I summarise that. Yeah. yeah the, there's different types of acid, alpha and beta acids, that are present in hops, and it's the alpha one that gives all beers their bitterness. In its normal form, it's not overly bitter, but when exposed to high temperature, it isomerizes, and that means it, it flips into its mirror form, and its mirror form, for some reason, is intensely bitter. So that's why where all beers get their bitterness from. Um, so if you reduce the amount of hops that you use, or you make sure they're not exposed to the high temperatures, then you can ensure that you get the flavours but without the bitterness. So in creating modern, juicier styles, you tend to reduce the temperature in the kettle before you actually introduce the hops. So even when you add um, hops at a late stage and you're not you're not introducing to the heat like you do with um, the, the bitterness hops, um, you still it still picks up some bitterness. So we found that when we um, developed our core range, we were doing it on a homebrew scale years ago. And then we um, we brewed it for the first time on our on, on our um, old brew kit. Um, there was extra bitterness being picked up on, on some of the beers that we hadn't anticipated. So um, what we ended up doing was um, dropping the initial kettle addition where you'd normally get your bitterness. We dropped that completely, and we were just adding hops at a late stage, and it was still bringing enough bitterness through that the, the, the beer still tasted um, where we wanted it to be. So. Um, most, uh, a lot of breweries use um, something called IBU, which is International international Bittering Units. Yep. So IBU is um, how you measure the bitterness of a beer, or how you, how you communicate how bitter a beer is. Um, so for, for yourself, it's probably a, a low-scale IBU, that you, you type of beers you'd be interested in. I'm um, the opposite, I love really bitter beers. Um, so piney, bitter, um, like, like I was saying earlier, West Coast of America style um, original. I'd love a can of uh, Sierra Nevada to torpedo right now. That'd be, um, oh, that'd be it's, it's super but, uh, strong and bitter. But it's a common, common misunderstanding that people think they don't like hops, but what they don't like is the bitterness that can be introduced by hops. My, my dad was the same. Yeah, it's he great. used to say, I don't like dem hops. That's what <laughs> um, and then his favourite beer was the first ever New England IPA we released, yeah. called Nuba. Yeah, it's um, it's really interesting. That's that's a great thing about beer. There's there's a beer for everybody, and we um, we we thankfully get to to um, show that quite often at our bars because we have a, a broad um, spectrum of beers that we brew. But also, even when it comes to pale beer, there's so much um, choice and variety that you can um, you, you can hopefully um, find out what people like and then um, help help them choose beers that they'd like in the future. I love this one. So, Thundertaker. Yeah, this. Before I thought it was a close run thing. Now I've drank this for two days. I think this is head and shoulders above all the others for me. But that's, that's personal. It, as I say, it is interesting because for me, the um, my, I, my preference is Scotty too hoppy. Um, I get I, I love guava, and I get real massive amounts of guava coming through in this one. Yeah, it, it, yeah. for me, it accentuates the coconut from the um, the uh, cryo pop. So it's like a double coconut hit for me, and. Um, Weirdly, because even though our uh, mate, one of our main beers, Tom Coker, is a coconut-based beer, I'm not a huge fan of coconut in a pale. So um, for, for me, I'm not like this. Doesn't it's a nice beer, but I, I prefer the Scotty Two Hoppy. Yeah, L Luke, our sales manager, just joined us. He's got a Scotty Two Hoppy sticker on, so uh, he, he, he's supporting the uh, Scotty Two Hoppy crew. Tell us about Talos. Tell us about Talos. <laughs> I think, Jason, do you want to pick that one up? Yeah, this is, a, again, a very, very new hop. It was only released uh, last year. Um, That's HBC 692, mm -hmm. yeah. I remember. Yeah, it's, it's, trial number was HBC 692, so you might have seen a few beers over the last uh, few years in, in its trial stage uh, released uh, under that number. Um, and yes, as I like said, it can take 10 years for a uh, a trial variety to become a commercial release, and Talus was such a unique, um, different variety to anything else that was in the portfolio, really. Um, it's a daughter of Sabro, so the, 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 the near Mexicanus lineage there. Um, it has that kind of that coconut thing, a subtle amount of coconut, similar to the Sabro, but much more 
uh, pink grapefruit, citrus. Um, yeah, and, and like I say, I, I think it's high in, in drain ale itself, so um, I think that's where that kind of deep guava top of is coming through, combining with the cryo pop. Um, yeah, I, I love how different that is to the three. I think that really stands out as um, such, a, such, a, such an impactful hop. One of the um, one of my favourite beers that we brewed using um, what it was called HBC 692. Um, we did a blend with I think it was that and Sabro, and we used it. We brewed a, um, a mild of all beers. We did it for a Viking festival, and um, I, I loved it. Unfortunately, the public didn't because. <laughs> It, it, didn't, it didn't score very highly on things like Untapped, but it, it really tasted like it was a barrel-aged beer, even well, though it was Yeah, because we used, um, this is proper geeking out, HBC 472, 472 yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is known to give a kind of woody kind of character yeah. into it. To yes, yeah, so, so we got like a yeah. woody coconut-aged flavour from the combination uh, in, a, in a very low-strength, mild beer. Um, so it was really interesting what it, do, what it do, does for the beers. So yeah, it's a pretty interesting, um, interesting combination of the different hops and uh, that work with Cryopop. Um, we, we chose to go a little bit uh, more sessionable, five and a half percent. We uh, we obviously usually like to go pretty big on beers, but we we figured if we're showcasing hops, and we want people to be able to drink them and have pint after, well, potentially four pints in a row. Well, that so. was agreed with um, Nick, who is what's his title now? Um, it's just changed, but he. Um, I always call him the, the, the research guy or the research chemist or... Yeah, yeah, he's a technical director. Technical Pop, director. Pop. So he oversees all the development. So Nick had said, for him, for hops to best represent themselves in pale beers, sweet spot's about 5 to 6%. So we went straight in the middle, 5.5. Nick, interestingly, has now moved across and looks after your hemp division, I believe. Yes, now. yeah, he's looking after that, yeah. So, like we were saying earlier, that there's a lot of similarities between can cannabis um, and hops, and the cultivation equipment, the harvesting equipment, etc., is the same, but they have polar opposite seasons. Yeah. So, yeah. all that equipment that would be sitting dormant for half a year, yeah. you're now able to utilize in harvesting hemp. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and creating CBD compounds, I believe, in the US. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it's just, yeah, uh, high market. CBD content low in THC, so it's, yeah. it's for the CBD extraction. Yeah. Well, you could probably be a commercial brewer. So the question that's just been asked is about ABVs and you getting kind of movement up and down. Yeah, yeah, consistency. Do you brew high and water down? Um, experience um, and calculation. Yeah. So we have quite, it's really, we're really geeking out now. So we have quite a detailed spreadsheet in which I would put all of my raw materials, uh, the amount of extract I would expect from my malts, etc. And I can change that with every batch that I get in. So I know exactly the amount of sugar I should get. And from the sugar, you know exactly how much alcohol you should get. So, but the reason I said you could probably be a commercial brewer if you're within a half of a percent is, I think up to, is it five and a half? You can be within 0.5%. Uh, is it seven and a half? So, so um, yeah, duty, the duty threshold. So, so, strength is really important in, in, in the UK in particular because you pay tax based on the strength of a beer. So, a lot of other countries you just pay um, tax based on the literage, whereas we pay based on litre and ABV, so per, per litre percent. Um, and up until seven, up to seven and a half percent, you pay in low, low, lower rate. As soon as it goes above seven and a half percent, you pay in higher rate duty. And um, so that's why imperial beers are always more expensive because you're paying the government more tax on them. Um, and then usually because you then use more ingredients and other stuff to get to that stage. But yeah, so um, the, the, the weird thing is you do have a big tolerance. So the, the HMRC allow you half a percent tolerance. So we could sell it. This could be a 5% beer and we sell it as a 5.5% beer. Uh, up to 7.5%. So if you're drinking a 4% beer, you could be drinking a beer that's 3.5%. You yeah. could be drinking a beer that's 4.5%. Uh, uh, yeah. But then as you go above 7.5%, that tolerance is 1%. So if you're drinking a 10% beer, you could be drinking a 9% beer or you could be drinking an 11% beer. Thankfully, yeah. we are quite good at our jobs. <laughs> so if it says 5.5, .5, it's more likely to be 5.4 to 5.6. Yeah. We, we can get it that way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and you've got um, uh, mass um, multinational breweries who really take advantage of this. So was it Carlsberg or Carling? No, Ka Carling, Carling is the classic example, so, so, yeah. which is 4.1%. 
and they took advantage of this and they brewed it to 3.6%. Because if they brew it to 3.6, they can use less raw material. So it costs them less to sell you that 4.1% beer. So it's not illegal, it's just morally dubious. Alright, so this is, so. is there any way of measuring that as a consumer? Yeah, yeah, yeah you, you could, um, as a consumer, not quite simple, not as simple. You could send it away to a lab to be analysed. We have a piece of kit called uh, an alkalizer, and um, it, you put the, um, you take a sample of the beer, and it can tell you what strength it is. Uh, that's uh, like a five thousand piece, pounds piece of kit. So it's not not really something you'd have at home to, to do the test. It's actually on. in Germany at the minute being repaired. Yeah, um, <laughs> to unfortunately broke. But yeah, the. Um, as a consumer at home, what you're doing is, um, if, if you homebrew, like, like you mentioned earlier, you're basically measuring how much residual sugar is in there. So you're looking at the starting sugar, the ending sugar, and then you're working at how much sugar is consumed, and then you're converting that into alcohol. Um, so so, so that, that's, that's the, the typical traditional way of, of measuring strength in beer. The complications come when you brew like we do, and we introduce lots of sugar into the process. So lactose is a non-fermentable sugar, so it doesn't convert to alcohol. And we use lactose in quite a few of our uh, speciality beers. So um, you've got to factor that in. You've got fruit, so uh, fructose, it's sugar, sugar and fruit. Um, um, that does convert to alcohol. Um, but you, you're bringing that in at a late stage, you're adding more sugar into to it, so you can't just use the starting sugar level or the ending sugar level, you have to then factor all these things in. Yeah, well, well I mean, we're probably going too overboard with this, but really difficult with fruit because you're generally introducing it as a puree or a concentrate, but you're not just introducing sugar, you're in introducing additional liquid. So you're adding sugar, but at the same time you're also diluting it, so you have to kind of calculate from both angles. Um, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's, it, the science behind beers, um, obviously, we can talk about for hours. It's pretty fascinating, but there's, there's so much more to, the, to just mixing a few ingredients and putting a product out there. Um, and working with your suppliers is one of the best things we get to do. So we um, we have a, um, a really good relationship with our malt suppliers. We have um, a big silo outside our, build, our, our new brewery where. The, the grain gets pulled in through a conveyor, gets crushed to the level we want it to be to extract the sugar efficiently. And then we work with um, the likes of um, Yakima Chief, so, so we get to choose the hot varieties we want to use, try and forward try and forward um, contract and project as best as we can. But it's really difficult because um, for five years, uh, we've only been around five and a bit years, and no, no two years have been the same. Because as you're trying to grow as a brewery, how do we anticipate where, how, many, how many hops we'll want in two years' time when we don't really know how well? I think we need to revisit next year's contract. <laughs> I, I, I want more Talus. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but, but that's the great thing about the industry. The industry itself, um, we're fortunate enough to, to work with a great bunch of people. Uh, it's such a like friendly environment, and it's not it's not that competitive amongst um, craft breweries. There's so many of us out there, but we all work together, which is great. And we all work really close with our suppliers. So it's just a really really good industry to be in. So it's not like um, our commercial corporate backgrounds where I mean, everyone's I can't at each really throat. think of an industry that compares mm -hmm. in terms of how we all work so closely together. And uh, like Wayne says, we're all really friendly. We don't consider each other competitors. Uh, we consider. Uh, your Heinekens and your Carlings and your, your Budweiser guys, they're the competition. So we don't really care if it's our beer in your hands or if it's Burden or Signature or whoever from here is beer in your hands, as long as it's not John Smith. <laughs> Another geeky aspect, we've talked about malt, we've talked about how we can dial that in with our suppliers, we've talked about hops, we've talked about yeast, we haven't talked really about water, and water's such a big proportion of what you're drinking. Um, and at a new brew house, we, we put an um, expensive piece of kit in to try and take the, dial the water back, take your, your, your mains tap water, remove all, the, um, all the, the, the mineral content, strip it back to basic, and then build it up from there, because water plays a really big part in your beer. So um, that's given us the ability to, to actually brew um, more traditional lager styles that, than we've ever been able to. So we've been experimenting quite a lot with that at the moment. And um, unfortunately, we can't use YCH for the hops because uh, yeah, I don't think you guys supply SARS. Do you? No, we do have a blend uh, that will replicate yes, it. So, so, yeah, uh -huh, yeah, so, we, so we, we've already spoken on this. So, <laughs> so, so we, we, we could be doing our uh, American Pilsner then soon. There you go. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so the Pilsner is so-called because it 
the original one comes from Pilsen in Germany. And, and the reason that they get such a clean, crisp flavour into their lager known as the Pilsner is because the water in Pilsner Pilsen is incredibly unusual. It has almost no mineral content whatsoever. So that allows even the small amount of hops that they use to present very cleanly. Um, so until the advent of reverse osmosis, where you're essentially able to create water that is similar to that in Pilsen, um, all you could really do was brew whatever your local water source suited, which is great because that's how we got all these different styles around the world. So Dublin has really hard water. Really hard water suits dark beer. Yep. So uh, finest example of the stout, arguably, in the world comes out of Dublin. And then um, yeah, you go to Burton and you've got a great example of um, water where it's great for making pale beer. So um, Burton upon Trent and you've got your um, your um, Bass. Was it, was it Bass? I think it was Bass, wasn't it, originally? Um, oh, it's all sorts. And then right. London, um, great water profile for porters. Um, it's, it, it's just really... Uh, it's just really interesting to, to we, we're so geeks out <laughs> we're probably boring you all to death with, uh, with, with, with the geeky stuff but yeah it's just really interesting to see to learn from uh, historic brewing and um, see what 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 worked well and try and then replicate it from our brewery in um, an industrial estate in york <laughs> trying to trying to replicate that pro water profile so any final thoughts on the beers back on topic so any um a any change in views on which is the favourite or all <laughs> all four? <laughs> number three, yeah. number two. Right, we're all very divided. We all like different things. That's the third thing. Though. That's the best thing about hops. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wrong apparently. It's number three. That's the best one. Fine. That means there's more number four for me. Something for everybody. So hopefully it, it gives you a good illustration of that. Hopefully everyone's enjoyed the different styles and different um, hop profiles. And I think a, a few us. lessons have been learned yeah, along the way. Awesome. I think um, next time I'd do something with slightly less malt character to accentuate the hops yet further. Um, but this is the start of the, the, the journey with Cryo Pop. It's uh, so so many you know so many different ways it can be used and so many different um, results that it can provide. You can get it on homebrew scale as well, can't you? Yeah, very soon. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Cry, cry or pop yeah. at home. Yeah. In fact, you guys are going into homebrew. Giving you a plug, uh, go. going into homebrew in a big way, I believe. Absolutely, yeah. This year that'll be that'll be launched. Um, so. If you yeah. need a brewery to do like a homebrew kit with, then uh, there you go. I, I might know a person. <laughs> All right. I, th I think that deal was sealed there, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Cheers, guys. Yes, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Just in time to watch the uh, tug of war.